there are a few questions that we didn't get to during my lecture, so I just wanted to follow up and answer those questions for you. All right, our first question is with left atrial tears, what do you tell the owners as far as home care? Exer are there any exercise restrictions, signs to look for to indicate they need to bring the patient back in? Great question. Um, I usually have them exercise restricted for at least a week, often two weeks. Um, and then I usually um, um, get that patient back in the hospital, look on ultrasound again and see if their pericardial effusion has resolved. If it has, I have them very gradually go back to, to normal activity. Um, if it hasn't, I have them exercise restrict a little bit longer. Um, and But most patients, after that healing has occurred and the pericardial effusion has resolved, they can then go back to normal activity. The symptoms that it's come back are um, consistent with the symptoms, all the symptoms that can occur with, with pericardial effusion, weakness, collapse, um, uh, GI symptoms, coughing, um, abdominal distension. If you diagnose the effusion as hemorrhage, how does your list of differentials change? Great, so, so if the effusion is hemorrhagic, my, uh, my, most of the, my list would include cardiac hemangiosarcoma, uh, coagulopathy, and left atrial tear would be the would be top of my list. We do see hemorrhagic effusion sometimes with chemodectomas as as well. Are there any other major concerns after removing an animal's pericardium? No, again, animals do quite well after a subtotal pericardectomy, so there are no um, um, no specific things to monitor for or, or risk factors after removing it. Again, the, the pericardectomy just prevents cardiac tamponade from effusion, but does not, uh, not prevent the effusion from happening. So the effusion might still continue into the thoracic space, into the pleural space. And so in those cases, there can be enough pleural effusion now to cause a problem. So in those cases, the patients would present with um, respiratory distress, tachypnea, or dyspnea uh, because there's so much pleural effusion. And if that occurs, sometimes that then needs to be removed with a thoracocentesis. Um, but um, that, that volume can be much, much higher. So um, a, in, a, in a kind of a medium-sized dog, 100 milliliters of pericardial effusion is enough to cause them to have tamponade and be severely ill. In the pleural space, which is much larger, 100 milliliters of fluid would not cause that patient to have any symptoms. And again, that, there's a lot of drainage where that can just be picked up um, and, and removed from the, the pleural space. So it takes usually, in a medium-sized dog, usually takes liters of effusion to start causing any clinical symptoms. So there is risk that it does accumulate to that point, but in many patients that never becomes a problem. Also, a Thoracocentesis can be performed and does not carry the risks of arrhythmias and laceration of the heart that a pericardiocentesis carries. So in, in some ways it's a, a, a bit of a uh, technically easier and um, um, less, uh, less risky procedure if, if that needs to be performed. And then what size catheter and length do you recommend for pericardiocentesis? It depends on the size of the patient. So I, in, a, in a large dog, I would use a, um, um, I use a, a 14 gauge catheter that's about six centimeters in length. Um, in a kind of a small dog, I might use a 16 gauge catheter that's about, that's about two and a half centimeters in length. And if it is a cat, I might use an 18 gauge catheter that's about an inch in length. And then can you have effusion and not have tamponade? You can. And so uh, an example from my, from my case series was Ginger the cat who had pericardial effusion, but since her heart was not getting compressed by that effusion and she was not having any, any symptoms, we did not consider her to have tamponade. So, so you can have pericardial effusion from any of the causes that we discussed today, but not all of those patients have, have tamponade. It just depends on the volume of the pericardial effusion, um, whether they have tamponade or not. Okay. 
And then how can you diagnose cardiac effusion without an ultrasound? You can have a clinical suspicion based on the fact that the heart sounds might not be as loud as you expect, so the, the fluid can muffle the sounds of the, of the heart, so quieter heart sounds. Um, you might have um, 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 the symptoms in the clinical picture. A radiograph that shows a very large globoid cardiac silhouette is a, is a, is a clue for that. And then there are some, some uh, physical exam findings, such as pulses paradoxus that we didn't discuss in the lecture, and some ECG findings, such as electrical alternums, that can be suspicious for pericardial effusion if you, if you don't have ultrasound. So it can be done. Are there any permanent treatments of pericardial effusion? It depends on the underlying cause. So, so uh, um, a, a patient that has pericardial effusion due to, say, um, um, lymphoma, if we can treat their lymphoma with chemotherapy, then we can stop their pericardial effusion. If it's due to heart failure, treatment with diuretic therapy stops their effusion. So yes, it depends on whether the underlying cause can be can be prevented. Of course, if a patient gets a pericardectomy, they're not going to get pericardial effusion again, but again, the, the, the effusion might con continue. It's just now pleural effusion and not in the pericardial space. And the last question is, do you need to aspirate all fluid during a pericardectomy? You aspirate, you, during a pericardiocentesis, you aspirate as much fluid as, as you can, but some, it's not uncommon that you don't get it all. And so sometimes we, we remove some and then the fluid stops flowing or in the adjustment of our catheter, it, it becomes dislodged from the pericardial space. So at that point, it's okay to kind of stop and see how much effusion is there. If it's a small amount and the patient hemodynamically seems like they are improved, then we might not remove any more effusion. Sometimes also, even if you didn't remove all the effusion, again, that if, you're, if your catheter was, was large, um, that did make a, a hole in the pericardium. And so sometimes you see some residual pericardial effusion and then that starts to go down within, within you know, um, minutes of removal because it's leaking out into the pleural space. So, if I, so I remove as much as I can, but if I don't remove it all, then I often wait to see if that's what's happening. If there's still enough left that the patient still has tamponade and I don't feel like we uh, uh, help them hemodynamically, then we, we, we repeat the procedure.